Hello and welcome to the Spiritually Incorrect Podcast with me, your host, Shiv Sengupta. For those who are not familiar with me, I'm the author of the Advaitaholics Anonymous books, Sobering Insights for Spiritual Addicts, and A Manifesto for Spiritual Anarchy. Both books were published by New Sarum Press. They're available through Amazon in Kindle and paperback formats and you can find them by clicking the links in the description below. Both these books have had a big impact and found great support among many veteran seekers for their willingness to critique spiritual culture, which, in my view, can act as a decoy designed to keep our vision perpetually focused away from what is most evident. Spirituality is a highly personal business, in my opinion. It is a person's unique relationship with reality. Yet the moment it is externalized and turned into a system of philosophy or thought, it ceases to be a personal affair. When it is made concrete for others to build a community and culture around, then the culture, rather than reality itself, gradually becomes the focal point. My writings have been controversial, to say the least, with some calling them visionary, others calling them iconoclastic, and still others claiming they are anti-spiritual. From my own perspective, I am merely one person expressing an opinion. I don't claim to, ha claim to have some handle on the, the ultimate truth. And there are those who will resonate with my opinions and those who won't. However, my purpose in beginning the Spiritually Incorrect podcast series is to connect and engage with other writers, thinkers, and spiritual teachers in the industry who don't necessarily fall into nor subscribe to the traditional guru stereotype. The idea is to explore some of the topics I cover in my books beyond the realm of my own opinions on the matter. So with that being said, I'd like to welcome my very first guest, who many of you will already be familiar with. She's a prolific writer and teacher, and her latest book is Death, the End of Self-Improvement, also published by New Serum Press. Welcome, Joan Tolfson. Thank you. It's good to be here. It's really good to have you, especially on the very first uh, episode of this series. Um, and Joe, you, you and I have had a chance to chat a number of times before. So, you know, I always enjoy my conversations with you. And I know we agree on a whole number of things and disagree on a whole number of things, but it's always really amicable. And I think we always, you know, there's a great takeaway from every one of our discussions. So, so thank you for joining me on this, um, on this podcast. Um, why, why don't we get started with a little bit of an introduction of yourself for, for some people who might not be familiar with you. Do um, you want me to introduce myself? Sure. Uh, let's see. <laughs> what can I say? Um, I don't actually think of myself as a teacher, although I guess I function as what might be described a te as a teacher, at least some of the time. I, I hold meetings and, and write books and things like that. Um, and, um, I have, um, I have a history of, um, a very eclectic history in the spiritual realm. Um, I was drawn to religion and spirituality as a small child, even though I was raised by non-religious parents. Um, and, uh, I got into Zen first and then, um, encountered Advaita and then what I call radical non-duality folks like Tony Parsons and Jim Newman, but old Jim wasn't around back then, but anyway, that kind of thing. And, um, <clears throat> I've sat with a Tibetan Buddhist teacher and, uh, you know, so I've dipped into many wells, so to speak. And, uh, I think all of those things, um, are kind of incorporated in what I offer as well as you know, obviously my own, my own, um, I mean, I always endeavor to come from my own, um, direct experience rather than, um, 
what I've learned or picked up from somebody else, but um, as I see it, and one of the ways where we maybe disagree a little is that I don't think spirituality is a really individual thing um, because I don't think we're really individuals. I think, you know, we're, we're, we are uh, one of the insights of Buddhism that I really resonate with is the whole idea of emptiness and interdependence that we are, we contain the whole universe and, you know, we are empty of, we are empty of anything substantial or inherent, but, but we are full of everything. <laughs> and, you know, we wouldn't be here without the sunshine and the rain and each other and the whole universe. So, um, and, and in my particular journey, um, well, I lived at a meditation retreat center run by, well, not run by Tony Packer, but founded by Tony Packer for a number of years and, and being engaged with other people who were involved in the same sort of work, um, was I think a, a really helpful thing, you know, um, it was the kind of helpful thing that you might get from living in a family or being in a relationship, except it was with people who were engaged in the same kind of process. So, so um, I certainly don't think, I mean, I do see all the pitfalls in tradition and, um, you know, the sort of cargo cult taking on of other cultures and, and, um, um, and so on. And I, and, and I'm basically operate in a very individual manner. I mean, I'm not associated with any one organization or tradition and I'm not, you know, I'm not part of any group really. Um, so um, in that sense, it's, it's individual, but I also feel like we're, we just are full, you know, we are, we are, we're like, I'm influenced by you and you're influenced by me and I'm influenced by everybody I've heard and read and worked with and all the people I've met with and likewise. So it feels both individual and also um, collective in some way. And, and, you know, I tend to feel like people find what they need. So, you know, for some people that might be a totally solo journey and for others, it might be being part of a group. There comes the cat. <laughs> um, the cat is on Oh, oh my cat. <laughs> Your cat, yes, comes down the stairs in the background. Yeah. Yeah, um, she 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 rules the roost in the house, so yes, <laughs> she's gonna yes. do her thing. And she has her own spiritual path, I'm sure. Absolutely. They they are very advanced in that way, I believe. Um, but um, but anyway, so so and then I've written five books, um, starting with Bare Bones Meditation and then Awaken the Heartland and Painting the Sidewalk with Water and Nothing to Grasp, and now Death, the End of Self-Improvement, and um I think of myself more as a writer than anything else. I'm, you know, I really love writing. Anyway, and I've always enjoyed our conversations and, and both of your books have had a big impact on me, even though I don't agree with you on everything, but um, they've both been a really wonderful shakeup and, and inviting me to look at things in a, a fresh way. And I've always really, and I really appreciate people that, um, that have that effect on me. And so, yeah, so, and I live in Ashland, Oregon and, you know, I'm getting old. So that's me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I appreciate you seeing that about the books. Um, you know, a couple of points that I'd like to discuss with you, you know, one of them being what got you to spirituality, but let's pause that for a second because I want to touch upon something you just said about how you endeavor to sort of stay true to your own instinct and your own experience, your direct experience, mm -hmm. rather than the influences that you've sort of had through this long path that you've with various teachers and traditions and all of that. And one of the, I would say, you know, the positive outcomes of, of spiritual culture. So, I, I, you know, I don't want to take a black and white approach. It's not all negative. But of the positive in, uh, sorry, outcomes of spiritual culture is that sense of community, that sense of belonging, those relationships, those bonds. Uh, you know, there are people who form lifelong and uh, long lasting friendships with others within these communities from that, those shared sort of experiences and beliefs, right? So um, very much like what you mentioned of belonging in a family, right? Uh, with the, your parents and the kind Although, of love. Can I, can I just interrupt sure. for a moment? Because it isn't just, be, you know, there's the joy of, of belonging and having companionship, but it's also the nightmare, <laughs> the difficulty, the challenge yes. of, you know, being with people that, you know, you don't always get along with or agree with and yes. particularly in a spiritual community it's not people you've chosen to be with it's you know people that you can find extremely irritating <laughs> difficult so yes. it's it's the challenge of that and then sort of the way that that helps you to sort of 
look at the places where you're stuck and self-righteous and all of Absolutely. those. Yeah. So but, and, and, and so, you know, similar to as within families, um, there is a challenge that every person within a family faces to find their own voice because those influences mm -hmm. of your peers, of the school system you're in, your teachers, your grandparents is so strong. Children are constantly struggling, uh, more in some families than in others, but there's that struggle to find okay, what is true to my experience and finding you know, your own mind, so to speak, is pa part of that path, right? Um, finding your own voice, whether that be as a writer or in your work or in your relationships or just in your relationship with reality. Um, and often what gets you onto that path of engaging with life becomes what stands in the way of finding what is that true connection? What is that point at which my relationship with reality is completely, completely devoid of those external influences telling me how I should read? relate or how I should interpret what I am looking at or how I am feeling. Um, so how would you say that plays into your spiritual path? Was there a point at which, you know, you started letting go of those influences and how did that happen? For you? Mm. Well, I mean, I think as I, as I wrote in a recent piece on, on Facebook, you know, I think my, my, my interest in spirituality and religion began very, when I was very young. And my father was an atheist, very interested in physics, um, who told me many things like that there's no free will and, you know, everything's made up of subatomic particles and um, you and the table are one whole dance and things like that. My mother was much more into positive thinking and love and I think she is a very, was a very spiritual person, but at that time, anyway, she wasn't part of any organized spiritual group. She did many years later join a church, but never in a dogmatic way. Um, anyway, so I wasn't raised in religion and I just got really interested in religion. I started reading books on religion and was really drawn to Buddhism, even as a child. And my parents were like, would take me around to different temples and churches and whatever I wanted to go to you know, so I could check it out, and they didn't um, push me in any direction, um, including, you know, non-religion. Um, so I had a very open, uh, encouraging exploration childhood in that sense. Um, and, um, and I think I've always just, you know, I've never, I've never really sort of, I've always kind of gone my own way when it, when it didn't kind of fit in with, with, I mean, every group I've been part of, I've ended up leaving, <laughs> although I remain in some way connected to all of them. But, um, but, um, and I did really, you know, Springwater, I mean, Tony Packer was the person I would consider my main teacher, even though she didn't use that word. Um, but I, and I was on staff there for five years. So I worked very closely with her and, um, and, you know, she had a huge influence on me, obviously, um, although her influence, what she was always pointing to was looking for yourself, testing everything out for yourself, never taking anything as a belief, um, challenging and taking, you know, anything she said could be questioned and looked and taken further. And so that's what she was encouraging everyone to, to be explorative and, and not dogmatic. Um, but, you know, I really needed to, and, and I could have been one of the people that stayed on and became one of the new teachers at Springwater, you know, but I, it felt I, I needed to go my own way. I needed to leave in order to find my voice, my own voice, and really do it the way I wanted to do it. And because there is a style at Springwater, there is a kind of, you know, even though it's a very open place there, you know, it, it, anytime you're in a group, it kind of develops its own way of being. And, um, yeah, so I needed to leave to find my own voice, and and you know I I'm I can feel the influence in my work of the different people, you know, particularly Tony. I mean, for example, I thought I had really invented the word seamlessness, and um, you know that I was using in my books, and then at one point I was rereading one of Tony's books, and like seamlessness was every other line, sort of, you know. So it's like <laughs> I clearly 
you know, I, I clearly can see the, the way all these people are woven into it, you know, because I don't, you know, I think the mind is very porous, whatever this is, mind, body, whatever, it's not walled off, it's all very porous, and we are drinking each other in all the time. So, so would you say you're still in the process of then finding that voice? Um, are you still sort of filtering out uh, influences as you go about, you know, writing your books and talking to people? Yeah, I mean, to me, this is an ongoing, lifelong, present moment, waking up. Um, you know, I don't see, I, that's how I see the spiritual path, is that it's about right now, right here, and it's, a, it's an ever-fresh awakening. So it's like... Um, that's part of what I loved about your books is that they 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 um, jolted me and made me look at things and and well wait a minute what am I doing here you know and um, so um, yeah I think it's an ongoing process I mean I I'm, that's one side of it I'm you know I can also say that I feel I found my voice in the sense that I you know I think I I'm not like sort of struggling with how to write something or I don't know you know but. But um, but uh, things just kind of pour out of me, the writing. And it does have different flavors at different times. And sometimes it has a devotional flavor. Sometimes it has a very stripped down bare bones flavor. Sometimes it leans in a more ad vital like direction. Sometimes it leans in a more Buddhist-like direction. Sometimes it leans in a more Tony Packer-ish direction. And, um, you know... And for a long time, I, I, I was trying to figure out which of those was right, which of those was the true way, which of those was best. And um, I finally kind of came to a place of seeing that they all have some piece of the truth or they're all, you know, you can't put the truth into words anyway. <laughs> and they're all, they're all just valid expressions in different ways. And so um, kind of no longer trying to figure out which one is the best or which one is right. And that's been relieving. Yeah, and, and you know, I find that one of the, the misassumptions we make is that there is such a thing as ultimate truth, right? And so we're oh. always trying to figure out, okay, well, which philosophy or which way of being most closely resembles this ultimate truth? And, you know, some people say, well, non-duality and the proof of that is, let's say, you know, neuroscience says there's no, there's an absence of self or the Buddha said there's no self. And I experience in my moments of, uh, you know, deep absorption or connection that, that there is no such thing as a self and thus non-duality must be the closest appropriation of the truth. Whereas somebody else is, you know, very much like in the material world doing them, you know, running about achieving things and totally believing in their sense of self-identity. Um, that might be the way they interpret the truth. And this assumption we make that there is a truth out there that can be interpreted one way and not another way makes us believe that there is one path to it. Whereas what I found is, well, the reason the truth can be interpreted so many ways is because it isn't any one thing. There are so many different scales <laughs> in which this reality exists. At the subatomic level, I mean, it looks nothing like this conversation we're having right now. Look, what are quarks and electrons? I have no idea. I've, I've seen little, you know, scientific modeling of it, but it looks bizarre. It looks like a computer game. And then at the galactic level, especially now with the James Webb telescope, I'm, I'm excited to see the kind of pictures that's going to take. It's going to put yeah. the Hubble telescope to shame. But even at the galactic level, what we've seen of the universe looks like something out of a fantasy novel, you know, like beyond sci-fi and it's spectacular. And it's almost like a brain can't comprehend what am I looking at here? It looks fantastic, but I don't even understand. And so reality is happening at, at a certain level there. And then there's this human level of interaction and ideas and all of it is reality. And reality doesn't re require itself to be any one thing because then it would be so limited. None of the other stuff would be possible. And even within the human experience, you know, I can have very, very hardcore beliefs of I'm a Christian or I'm an American and I want this and I, and, and, you know, somebody coming from a Buddhist perspective where, oh, there's no self and, you know, um, life is impermanent, all of that. 
could look at that person and go, well, that person has no grasp on reality. But they are grasping reality, just in a different way than you are grasping reality. And so from my perspective, when I think of spirituality, it's not, you know, philosophy and all of that is one way of getting at spirituality. But it really comes down to, and this is why I said, it's a personal relationship with reality, because how we interpret reality is our spirituality, even if it looks nothing like spiritual teachings or philosophies, right? It could look as simple as, oh, well, you know, I'm, I want to invest in Bitcoin because, uh, you know, I was be a millionaire in the future. That could be how I interpret reality. It could be that basic and that sort of narrow-minded. And you know what? That's what spirituality looks like in mm -hmm. my realm of experience, right? And I think that is a perspective that sort of the spiritual industry is still caught up somewhat or limited somewhat in using these very esoteric philosophies of life and saying, well, because we have this 30,000 foot view on life, that is the view that you should be trying to emulate in your day-to-day -day experience. Rather than saying, hey, there is this 30,000 view of life, but it's not the only view of life out there. It's one view of life. Hey, you want to try it out? Mm -hmm. You know, that, so, so some of the, 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 I wouldn't say problems, but some of the criticisms I have with spiritual culture in general is that they are so hyper-focused on the teachings and the philosophies and the perspectives those put forward that they've lost sight of the fact that there's so many, there's such a multitude of perspectives okay. that all encompass what spirituality is about for human beings, right? Um, so, so the way I use the word spirituality is a lot different um, than you know, how some others will. I've mean, got some flack from, from people saying, why, why do you even use the word spiritual? Like, you know, if, if you don't believe there's a God out there with a long gray beard, who's judging us, or you don't believe there's a soul that transmigrates, then what is spiritual about life? Why do we need this word? Um, and you know, from my own perspective, the word spiritual points to something that I think we don't have a vernacular for in our sort of post-modern view of life, which is very sort of materialistic, right? It, it looks at evidence, it's science-based, and all of that is great. But when it comes to the subjective experience of a human being and how they relate to life, a lot of that becomes completely reduced when you look at it purely from that sort of science-based perspective. And that essence of what it means to be human, which really mm -hmm. is captured through music or emotion and all of that, gets lost when we use these sort of cut and dry explanations and definitions. And that, that spirituality sort of points away from the objective view to much more self-centric you know subjective view of life um that's I'm, cur I'm curious how you define the word spirituality having mm. the experiences you've had yeah well i love what i loved everything you just said um and really resonate with it um yeah i um well i don't believe in you know some person up in the sky with a gray beard or um or even some kind of separate creative force that's running everything I don't believe there's a soul that transmigrates from one life to another. Um, although I sometimes use the word soul, but that's not what I mean by it. Um, I don't mean some little entity inside here. Um, and I, I love the way, yeah, I think you're getting at what I feel also about spirituality and what you say, because um, the way I look at it, you know, it's about it's it's not about philosophy or intellectual formulizations and conceptualizations, although that always sort of is involved to some degree, because he, as soon as we start talking about it, that gets into the picture. But it's really about, yeah, a dimension, a, a, a kind of immediate, direct dimension that cannot be doubted. It, you know, but the beliefs about it, this is the way of formulating it can always be doubted. Like the example I often give is, I cannot doubt the, the sort of shape, the, this black shape I see in your hand. I can, 
I can doubt whether it's a gun or a cell phone or, or a hallucination or a brain experience or um, an, a floater in my eyeball, but I can't doubt just the sort of what Zen would call the suchness of that, just the, just the, the immediacy of that experiencing. And to me, spirituality, and, and that kind of gets to what you said about music, like, you know, we can't really, you know, you can't put into words what, how you're moved by a piece, well, you can, but it's not the same as how you're moved by a piece of music. Um, or, you know, a poem, what you get out of a poem is not the same as what you might read if you, if you try to analyze the poem or something, you know, it's like, so spirituality to me, it, it is that dimension of, of, you know, kind of the aliveness of everything or the immediacy rather than the formulations, although that gets into it too. And, and it gets so subtle because, you know, it's like the, the map is not the territory, but mapping is something the territory is doing. And the map is also part of, you know, like I really agree that, that um, you know, there's so many dimensions to whatever this is, you know, from the subatomic to the intergalactic to our personal everyday life to the experiences we have in meditation, to, you know, you name it. So there's all these different dimensions and the way I don't feel like we really know. I mean, I don't feel like I can say whether consciousness is the ground of being or whether consciousness is created by the brain or the brain is just an appearance in consciousness or, um, I mean, how do I know any of that? I mean, I know that I don't experience anything outside of what we could call consciousness. <laughs> but I can't even get hold of what consciousness is. And, you know, and so it, it feels to me, and I think you said this, like a lot of people, and, and bl blessedly Tony Packer was not like this, but a lot of people, you know, they have a very definite view and then that's it. And you're either right or wrong. And there's no, there's no two ways about it. And to me, it's much more, I think that I, I feel there's great freedom and beauty in not knowing and in, in being open and be and, and I and being open like I keep discovering new things. You know, it, I keep finding, you know, I say one thing and I'm sort of on one track and then I all of a sudden I see something that makes me really just question that and see it in a whole different way. Or science is always discovering these new things, you know, it's like uh, there's no end to it. And and to me the beauty is in being open to that and, and being free to, to change, not, not feeling like, well, but you know, it's, it's so easy if you, it, particularly if you become a teacher and your whole life in your career and everything else is built around having this particular view, um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, pressure there, internal pressure, external pressure to, to maintain that and not to question it. You know, you don't want to suddenly think, oh, wait, maybe, maybe I don't really know that consciousness is the ground of being. <laughs> yeah, and, and I think and that's part of one of the problems with that culture is the, it is a culture of certainty, providing certainty to people who don't have it. And so sitting as a teacher, um, you know, the typical group occupies a position of he or she who knows and the students being the, 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 the ones who are yearning to know, who are seeking to know. And so the teacher is providing that certainty. So if they themselves are experiencing any doubts, conveying that doubt sort of becomes a self-defeating purpose in their role as teacher. And that's one of the problems with, the, with spiritual culture in my view is that too few teachers are willing to question their own assumptions, at least publicly in front of their students and willing to say, hey, you know what? I'm one of you guys. I, I'm trying to figure this out myself. You know, I, all I can do is share my own sort of experiences with you. If they make sense or if they're any relevance, great. But I don't claim to know a whole lot more than you do, right? Um, and to be honest with you, being a father and you know, having young kids has, has really sort of given me that, that firsthand experience of the beauty of not knowing because there's nobody who doesn't know as much, much as a young child does, right? Yeah. <laughs> they don't know anything. But they're able to connect with life in a way that we as adults struggle. And, and I still struggle. I wouldn't be able to connect as 
in depth in, in such an effortless manner the way my four-year-old does. Now, she's in the habit of every day coming home from school and bringing a stick or a stone or some random feather. And there's a collection that is just out of sight here of what I would term crap, just piling up in the corner. But to her, it's a treasure. Like every little thing, every stick looks identical to me. She's a little stick and she's falling on the ground. But she's, it has arrested her attention enough for her to stop in her tracks gaze at it for five minutes, pick it up, look at it, and then cherish it and want to keep it. And I'm not allowed to throw any of them away, so they're just collecting, right? And, she, and if, I, if I ask her, Kaya, can I throw this one in the trash? It's been sitting here for a month. No, this is the one I picked up here when I was with this person doing this. So, and I'm like, I find it fascinating that these little, you know, items that, you know, we notice every every day as we go about barely notice, have assumed such importance in her life. That means she is connecting with her environment in a way that I'm not able to. Um, compare that to my eight-year-old who used to be like that, but now is a little bit more immersed in the world of ideas and the things her friends say and the things her teachers say. And, the, and, and I see that transformation happening where she's losing the she still will pick up the odd trinket or shiny piece of glass that she or seashells she finds on the way, but not to the extent that she used to. You know, the, the attention is being directed now away from the real to the abstract, right? She's living a little bit more yeah. in her head. And, and, and it really is fascinating to me, this transition, that as we begin to know more about the world through our abstractions of it, the less we seem to be able to connect that way because there's an automatic interpretation that happens. The mind will automatically interpret. Even if I sit meditating and gazing at a tree for an hour, I may very well be able to form a deeper connection to that tree and be able to see it for what it is. But I cannot prevent my mind from still interpreting it as a tree. You, you see what I'm saying? That becomes sort of a learned habit. And that points to what you were saying is influences. You know, these influences are not just the teachers in our life or the, or the relationship in our life. They are society, they're, they're, they're human culture and all of that is influence. And as those influences grow, we begin to, it starts to veil in a sense, or it, it not necessarily makes it opaque, but it sort of becomes translucent. And we're, we're, we're seeing through the, the lenses of the things we've learned and been taught. Um, and so it is, it is a you know, beautiful thing to me to watch children because it, I come to realize that no matter how much I know, that knowing is actually not going to bring me closer to connecting with reality. The knowing is beautiful. It's its, it's own process. It's a different kind of knowing, it seems. You know, like there's a direct knowing and then there's the knowledge, the, the kind of knowing of information second hand kind of yeah we call that a tree and we know that it has roots underground and blah 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 and then there's just the immediacy of the of the visual image and or the touch of it or whatever and and to me yes yeah, spirituality is really about rediscovering you might say that world of childhood but not as a child but i mean rediscovering that that um that openness and, and, and we so, can. so, and we so can. My, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Sorry, what I was going to say, and one of my sort of points of contention with most spiritual culture teachings is that even though they claim to direct a person towards that first kind of knowing that you were talking about, which is more direct, they really become a form of the second kind of knowing. Yeah. Because what they, they do tend to do is provide pointers and information and, and, and words and ideas and abstractions through which people indirectly may connect to that. And I find that at, in, in the beginning, it may help because those pointers may direct somebody towards something that they haven't even conceived in their mind. But at a certain point, they become the very thing preventing us from seeing that because that has to happen in a very spontaneous manner, yeah. in a very individual manner. And as long as somebody's sitting there holding your hand through the process, then, you know, that, 
that becomes the, the obstacle in that path. So that's been my sort of view and interpretation. Of it. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel blessed that I've encountered many teachers who are not sort of doing that, who are kind of admit, you know, acknowledging that they don't know how the universe works and are changing their minds and are open. And, and, and certainly uh, my experience in Zen is that it's very much about sort of blasting through or deconstructing or, or pointing beyond the conceptual realm and sort of, um, but it's true that, that, you know, once you have, you, once you, once you organize it into a path and once you have literature and once you have ways of doing it, so that's the potential pitfall. And the best teachers are aware of that pitfall and, you know, are, are always kind of trying to undermine that, but, but, um, but it's, it's, it's just, and it's, it's there, even if we're not in a group, it's there, you know, like, like, it's just a, it's just sort of a part of being human is that we do have language and concepts. That's part of how we function. And we can't leave that behind, nor would we want to. I mean, unless we have a brain injury or something, you know, um, it's part of, it's a valid dimension of life as, you know, but, um, but we can reawaken and rediscover that kind of, and I think, you know, great art is, is also, that's what it kind of does. Like if, if going to a wonderful movie with beautiful cinematography doesn't necessarily, and by beautiful, I don't necessarily mean beautiful shots of nature, but just, you know, really great photography. Um, when you come out afterwards, you're seeing in a new way, you know, that's an experience or you listen to a piece of music that moves you deeply. And when it's done, you're in a different, you're feeling something different. And, and um, so I think art also is potentially, you know, an invitation or a way of waking us up again to. Yeah, and I, I think you're right. It's, it's anything that sort of breaks that status quo pattern way that your mind is used to interpreting things. Yeah. And art can be can really be shocking in that sense that you know especially when you when you look at some of the postmodern art that you know we've, we've seen it sort of shocks your brain because your brain's not able to understand what it is looking at you know when you look at modern art and things like that um, but the same goes for music the same goes for good filmmaking and it's that interesting that you you mentioned Zen because Zen traditionally is, and this is why they utilize the co-ed, it's supposed to confuse your mind so that it can't rely on the intellect to solve its problems, right? because we're, we're so reliant on our intellects to try and sort through the conundrums that we encounter in everyday life. Every dilemma that's posed to us, the mind's trying to use logic to, and ra reasoning and rationale to sort through it. But in Zen, you're like, no, we don't want to engage that part of your mind. The part of your mind is great, but is not what we're looking for. What we want to engage is another aspect of your awareness that is, is much more direct in contact in reality. That, that doesn't uh, sort of treat re reality as a problem that needs to be sliced and diced and sort of figured out that way, but just taken as a whole and just accept it for what it is and engage in that sense. And I think, you know, traditionally Zen has tried to take that approach over time and not through the centuries, like you know, a lot of other cultures, it has fallen prey to some of the dogma and, Within sanghas, you see, um, you know, some corruption and power struggles and all of that. But uh, I, I have an interesting story that I'll, I'll relate to you uh, along this effect. Um, so, as you know, I lived in Japan for a number of years, you know, eight years. And when I first moved to to the northern island of Hokkaido, I had this very sort of romantic view of what Japan was. Right and I, at the time, I was quite into reading Zen and. I'd always loved the whole samurai culture as a kid. So I was like, oh man, this is going to be great. So we moved there and, um, you know, within the first month of us living there, a, a local priest's family invited us for dinner. It's a small town, few foreigners in town. Uh, my wife and I, you know, we, we weren't married and didn't have kids at the time. So oh, we'd like to take you out for dinner and some drinks after. I'm like, oh, okay, that's great. And I was talking to my wife, oh, I can't believe we're going to be meeting a Buddhist priest and, oh, this is going to be great. I'm going to talk philosophy with him and all of that. So we sit down to dinner 
and the Buddhist priest is there with his wife and you know he's like okay what's everyone drinking and I'm like I'm happy with beer and so he orders a round of beer they come in these big pint sized mugs and I'm slowly sipping mine because you know I want to be somewhat spiritual I don't want to look like an alcoholic on my very first time <laughs> meeting the Buddhist priest and I'm on my second sip and I look at his glass and it's freaking empty he's just down the whole thing and he's already calling for the second round right and I'm looking at my wife and she's smiling at me and I'm, you know my, my whole illusion here is just being shattered <laughs> right in front of my eyes and within that first hour he he knocked back about five times you know he's like let's go to the next bar and man he was drinking his face off and so was I with him and, and then we go for some karaoke at the end of the night and he's singing on the top of his lungs till 2 a.m and then he goes come back to my place we're gonna have some tempura and ramen for a late night snack so I'm like all right let's do this so we go there and we're all drunk eating tempura and I go to him and at some point I'm like you know what this knife has completely defied my expectations I thought I was meeting a highly spiritual man and you know a Buddhist priest and this was going to be uh, you know we were going to talk zen koans and this and that and haikus and instead we just drank our faces off ate a lot and sang at the top of our lungs and and he starts laughing and he goes well you know this is spirituality too yeah. and and that was you know back then I was still a little bit naive in my whole you know view of spirituality and for me that was a that one moment was you know a big turning point because I realized that I'd built up 30 years, I was about 28 at the time, 28 years of expectation based on what I, the books I'd read, right. of, of what this culture is like, of, of what the life of a, a Zen master or a, a teacher is like and all of that. And this was the reality, no different than anybody else. It's just an ordinary person getting shit face on a Saturday night uh, and having a great time. Um, and, and so, you know, this is one aspect of, of spirituality that I think tends to get lost within the culture because they, they begin to, uh, the culture congeals around some ideals of, of, around people and human behavior and human potential and starts to gradually filter out those, those very normal, ordinary, messy bits of ourselves, right? Which, you know, um, they're drinking a lot of beer on a Saturday night doesn't feature in most Zen teachings, for example, right? And well, actually, so actually in Zen it does, but <laughs> because Zen, that's a very Zen evening, actually, <laughs> I would say. Yeah, so, so, so I learned but, that yeah. much later on, that that is actually pretty much a standard uh, evening with a, with a Buddhist priest in Japan, because I've had many nights like that since then. And honestly, some of the best people to party with, if you're ever in Japan, is priests. I will let you know that. Well, uh, but but I'm interested in your your own experience with uh, with some of the teachers you've been with. You know what have been some of some areas in which you feel you felt they were lacking in some way, and some areas in which they surprised you. Well, they you know any teacher is a human being, so they're always there. They have a personality. They have you know certain ways in which they're you resonate with them in other ways where you kind of ugh, don't resonate with them and, <laughs> you know, and they're just people and they have, you know, some of them drink and get drunk and some of them are sober and never drink and, um, you know, they're all different. And, um, but I have to say that, 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 um, that, sort of sense of just ordinary life was is very much there in the Zen and the Buddhist teachers. I There's a lot of different kinds of Zen and a lot of different kinds of Buddhism and, and even the different sanghas that I've been somewhat part of or have sat done retreats with are very different in their flavor and what they do. And some of them do koans and some of them don't. And some of them do them in very different ways from the others. And But, um, you know, for example, I've done a few retreats with John Tarrant and his people and um, and they're very out of the box. I mean, they're like, um, for example, there was an issue of one of the Buddhist magazines on distraction and most of the articles were about how to avoid distraction, how to be mindful, how to be present. 
John's article was about how wonderful it is to be distracted. <laughs> um, you know, and uh, and it just seems like there's a lot of that in Zen, you know, sort of um, defying expectations and um, and kind of trying to unstick you from any place where you get stuck. But of course, as an organization, there is always the tendency, if the organization has a personality and a flavor and, you know, and, and in some cases that's a very, um, that gets very kind of sober and fundamentalist and, ugh, and in other cases it gets very wild and it can go, you know, it can be, that can become something too. Oh, we have to be wild. You know, we have to always, get drunk or something, you know, then that's just another thing. So it's like, it's subtle. And it's, um, that's why I think it's, it's every moment, you know, waking up and, and, and to me, you know, it's like, well, because we see the pitfalls in in something doesn't mean that you can't, that it's not worth having it, you know, it's like, there's pitfalls in everything. And there's benefits and everything, you know, like being in an intimate relationship, it has pitfalls, it has great benefits you know being solitary has great benefits and great pitfalls you know anything so spiritual community is the same way it has pitfalls and it has things that it offers and so but uh oh you so you're saying like the teachers what was the question the teachers something so, like or so another another teacher Anam Tupton that I that I've done several retreats with he's a Tibetan Buddhist teacher yeah. and he has a wonderful sense of humor and, you know, he just, what does he say? If you're, there's something about if you're, if you're, if you make a mistake, you should celebrate by eating chocolate. I can't remember the exact quote, but I mean, he's very, you know, he talks about the, 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 the golden arches of McDonald's are spiritual. The freeway is spiritual. Um, you know, he's very human. He readily admits that he's deluded and that he has delusion and, um, um, he's very human, and um, so, you know, I've experienced a lot of theater. Lately, I've been listening to a lot of talks by a Zen teacher named Henry Shukman, who's in Taos. He grew up in, in, in England, and, and he seems very, like, exploring new things, going in new directions, um, very open-minded, and um, really liking a lot of the things that he says. So I think there's, there's just a lot of variation out there, but, but I think there are there are any number of teachers who, um, who are really open and, and, you know, willing to admit what they don't know. And, and it's interesting you bring up the variations because the variations are not, not highly evident. Like um, the, the general impression <clears throat> I get from the industry, um, and, and this is a, you know, this is an assumption that I'm willing to question for myself. And this is why you know, I'm, I'm interested in engaging with people like yourself who's been on the inside for long enough that they've seen these exceptions to the rule. But the general rule that I see is that this is a culture that tends to elevate the extraordinary above the ordinary. Um, and, and it becomes a culture of seeking the extraordinary, whether that's extraordinary experiences, extraordinary states of mind, extraordinary philosophical point of view, points of view, but something more than what the seeker right now or the student is experiencing in their life, which is most, in, in a lot of cases, some confusion, some angst, some, you know, a lack of clarity about what to do in their life or who they are, some sort of internal crisis. And there's the assumption of the seeker's part that, okay, well, something is wrong here. I mean, this can't be what life is about. And then there's this projection coming from outside from the culture that yes there's something wrong and there's there's another way to be that is better that is right or superior and we will get you there through whatever path we will get you there and <clears throat> what you're saying to me is that there are teachers out there or, and they may not call themselves teachers um, who are not presenting that perspective to these people they're instead you know giving the opposite viewpoint of what you are interpreting right now about your life is just one way of interpreting it, but this is just ordinary life. And this is, this is what, you know, spirituality looks like. There isn't a more elevated state. Uh, not that you can't have elevated experiences, but those are not necessarily superior or something you need to go in search of in order to feel alive um, or, or in order to feel validated in your human existence. So I'm just curious, you know, in your perspective, what is it about this culture that you 
think projects this image of perfection, enlightenment, uh, higher experiences, a higher self. Um, this, this projection of elevation above the normal human experience. Well, I think there's a lot of paradoxes in here because, um, you know, on the one hand, there's nothing to get. <laughs> And, and yet there is kind of something to get, like we were talking about, there's that sort of um, rediscovery of the, of the aliveness and the freshness of, that we had in childhood or um, seeing through some of the ways that we're stuck in our concepts. Um, so there is kind of something to get or something to shift or something that can open up. Um, and at the same time, as soon as we make that into a goal, as soon as we, which is what the mind tends to do, as soon as we kind of turn that into, ah, okay, that's what I want. Oh, I want to be open like I was as a child. And, and I'm doing this in order to get that again. And then let's see, am I as open as this person or that person or, you know, whatever. And then it's the opposite. It's, you know, it's kind of the opposite of what we're trying to do. So, you know, a good teaching or a good teacher, you know, points, he keeps trying to jar you out of that, you know, keeps, you, you know, you begin to see how the mind is doing that. Like at a certain point, you know, I spent quite a few years and of course, you know, the whole expectation of enlightenment and everything. I mean, where does it come from? I mean, there's all these stories of people getting enlightened and, and there are teachers who go on and on about their enlightenment experiences. And, you know, and, and then especially if they're set up in a very hierarchical way, but even in the, in the way Tony Packer did it, where she wouldn't even call herself a teacher, still she was the teacher. And so, you know, there's just the, 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 the setup, you know, it all kind of, so naturally, and you see somebody that, that really radiates just kind of an openness and an aliveness and you, you, you feel like, yeah, I'd like that. That's something there that I really attracts me. And so, and then, it seems like the best teachings are always kind of pointing back to, it's just right here, it's just right now. It's not, you know, it's not something you need to attain or get or, or, you know, be like this other person. It's just right here, right now. And the mind keeps trying to turn it into this something else. And the good teaching keeps kind of waking you up to right here, right now. But, um, or I shouldn't say good teaching, I should say the kind of teachings that I resonate with. Um, but, um, you know, let me and ask I, you this let me ask you this, Joe is it necessary? So, we've talked about, you know, regaining that, that clarity of perspective that, you know, we once enjoyed as a child, being able to connect more directly with reality, all of that, and, and having experienced it directly in our own lives, we understand the value of it. And so we have sort of that perspective that we bring. But my question to you is, is it necessary? Does a human being need to pursue that? Is it just as well if they're completely lost in their abstractions and they live out their lives and die? Is that somehow inferior to that path of rediscovering, you know, what is real, what is spontaneous? Um, what, is, what is your thought on that? Well. I wouldn't say, I, w I mean, I don't believe anything is necessary. I mean, it seems to me everyone has a unique one, you know, I feel everyone's path is unique. And I would never say there's one way that you have to do it or everybody has to do it this way. Um, and and I, 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 don't, I wouldn't subscribe to the idea that one thing is sort of better than another in, in, in a certain kind of way. On the other hand, um, you know, I, I do admit to a preference for, um, you know, Buddha over Hitler. <laughs> and, and I find both Buddha and Hitler within myself. And I notice that the part of me that behaves like Hitler in various ways um, is involves suffering. It, it's, it doesn't feel good internally, although it may have ultimately doesn't feel good inter internally. And it seems to not be that helpful to other people. And so I have, there's a kind of preference, you know, and, and I could say that, that, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I mean, both of those dimensions, Buddha and Hitler are part of the same, whatever this reality is, and who can say, I mean, good things come out of, 
what Hitler did and bad things come out of what Buddha did, you know, it's, you can't really divide things up so neatly, but at the same time, I can say that I have a preference for, you know, that, that one of them feels more, um, well, you know, like, you know, I went through a history of alcohol and drug addiction, mostly alcohol addiction. I did a lot of drugs, but I wasn't really addicted to them, but, but, um, and, you know, and I've also experienced depression, um, and, you know, yeah, I have a preference for being free of that over being stuck in that. I wouldn't say that it's better or, you know, spirit, you know, it, it, that puts something extra on it, but it's certainly less painful. And so, and I can say that for myself, being with various teachers and engaging, you know, doing, being in meditation and going on retreats and all of that has been, I feel has been helpful. Like, it's helped me to see the ways that I get caught, the ways that I get stuck, the ways that I get, and I, you know, it's not, I don't feel like I see it all the time or that I'm now free of all that completely always, because again, it's an ongoing thing, but, but it's certainly made a big difference in my life, it feels like. And, yeah, but somebody, a, could, somebody could, could get to the same place, quote unquote, by, you know, never doing anything organized spiritually and, and maybe through being in a family or, or um, a career in the arts or who knows what. I mean, I don't feel like, oh, the, the only way to get there is the path I took or the path that opened up for me. But, but so, so it's kind of, it's that paradox again, if there's nowhere to go, this is it right here, right now. And at the same time, yeah, there are kind of are things that we're interested as human beings in, in kind of in doing like, you know, it'd be nice if we didn't have racism and sexism and, you know, all kind. there's just things that we humans seem moved. It would be nice if everybody had enough food to eat on the planet, you know, <laughs> and, and uh, be nice if, you know, we didn't have a nuclear war. But, you know, I also have the perspective that if there is a nuclear war, it's okay on some level. It's what is, you know, but, but so it's kind of that it's both. It doesn't feel like I can really land on either side. And that's interesting what you say about suffering, because I think probably most human beings would have a preference not to suffer over suffering. I mean, right now, if you, if you would ask me, Shiv, do you, uh, would you prefer being pain-free in your body, which I happen to be right now, versus having some kind of chronic pain? I'd say, obviously, I'd like to be pain-free. However, when I look back on my life in hindsight, and I look at all the suffering I've been through, and if I was given some magic power to go back and change all that, get rid of that suffering, and help my past self have a more enjoyable experience of those moments, I would never change a thing. I would refuse to. Because in, my, in hindsight, that suffering was absolutely vital to me. And I wouldn't want not to have suffered. So it's a very interesting thing. Because when we look forward, we always tend to do more optimistically. Yet when we look back in hindsight, we, see, we have a much more well-rounded, uh, well, not everybody does, but you know, um, we tend to have a more well-rounded view of things because we see how the, the patterns that have unfolded. So understanding that that is the nature of life, mm -hmm. while I wouldn't personally, from a preference point of view, suffer, I also understand that that suffering is vital to my evolution as a human being, just my development. Mm -hmm. um, and, that, and that I'm never going to want to suffer, but that suffering is going to do things for me that will benefit me in certain ways, just as it always has. So if I think about my child, and I'm sure when you look back, you know, on your own past and your alcohol addiction, you can see those patterns of how those things needed to play out that way, that there really was no other way to avoid it. But that has played such a big part in your perspective today, right? That they're, they're indistinguishable from each other. It's just time allows us to interpret it as the story of the evolution of me. But really they're so connected, the, these events in the past and the way we perceive things today or will in the future. So that is the problem I have with teachings that seem to portray the idea that suffering is something that we should seek to transcend. I'm not saying all teachers are doing that by any stretch of imagination. And you know, your own view on things is much more agnostic. You're, you're, you're seeing it as a preference. 
but a lot of teachings don't put it across as a preference. They don't, they don't say, you know, oh, you know, you would probably like it better if you didn't suffer. No, like, you know, teachings, especially Buddhist teachings, say there is suffering, suffering in the world, dukkha, there's a way of getting past that suffering, and we should seek to get past it, right? There's this very sort of linear view of, of the evolution of human being. Whereas for me, yes, my preference is not to suffer, absolutely. I mean, I, I'm a human being and that's just how we're wired. But I also don't tell people that seek not to suffer or seek to transcend suffering. Because the moment a person is doing that, there may be suffering in their hardwired into their system that needs to play itself out. And until that happens, they're not going to be able to get past that. So it becomes a form of repressing our conditioning in order not to have to suffer. Then allowing that condition to play out, get it out of the system and then move on. You see what I'm saying? I do. And again, I think it's a paradox because, well, I've never heard anyone say, in my experience with teachers, no one has said to me, seek not to suffer. Um, but, um, and I, I distinguish between suffering and pain, like pain and painful circumstances are an inevitable part of life. Suffering is kind of what we overlay on top of that, the way I use the words. So, um, so, um, and so you can have a painful circumstance and it becomes suffering depending on how you think about it. Like if you think this is ruining my life, it's the end of the world, I'm a horrible person, you know, that's suffering. Um, having cancer or being having chronic back pain or something or whatever is, is just a, something that's happening. Um, so I make that distinction. And, and yes, as I look back, I mean, I'm very grateful that I was born with, you know, that I had one of my hands amputated in the uterus. I'm very grateful that, you know, I went through the drunken thing that I went through. I'm very grateful, you know, that I had cancer a few years ago and that I, you know, my life has been quite altered by it um, in ways that, you know, I wouldn't choose. <laughs> um, all of that has been, you know, part of, part of, um, you know, that there've been, many blessings and all of that. And I think everyone can, can experience that. Um, but at the same time, it's that paradox, like, you know, and it's a fine line. It feels like, like I can really appreciate certain people who spent their lives being drunk, like, you know, whatever, Alan Watts, Charles Bukowski, you know, um, maybe they sobered up at some point, but I mean, you know, so it's not about, it, it's not about, oh, this is good and this is bad, but, but still, I mean, like, right, like, like the thing that happened to why, why my arm got amputated was, you know, the amniotic band ruptured and wrapped around my arm and strangled it off. Well, I think now they have with laser, not laser, but, um, you know, this whatever that uh, laparoscopic surgeries and stuff. I think that when they notice on a, an ultrasound that that's happening to a baby, they can now go in there and actually unravel it and, and save that baby's arm or head or whatever it might be. And I would never say, oh, don't do that because it's really valuable to have one arm. I mean, it is, it was, it has been. <laughs> but at the same time, you know, I wouldn't wish for anybody to be born with a disability or say, oh, you shouldn't, if there's a possible way to cure it, you shouldn't do that because it will be so valuable. Or, you know, oh, don't recover from addiction because, you know, you, it, it's, it's great. Um, you know, it's that sort of parent, it's, I can't, again, I can't land on either side of that. Like I see, I see that it's all part of life and that it's all, and, and that is actually in a lot of spirituality. I mean, that's very much there in Zen, certainly, that the darkness is, you can't separate the darkness and the light and it's, yeah, it's all I, part of it. I, but, I, but, you know, and, and again, we have to distinguish because there, there are strands of contemporary Buddhism that are very much about sort of behaving in a spiritual way um, and, you know, being good and, and, you know, that I don't really resonate with. Yeah, but, and it's interesting because, yes, it's not wishing the suffering away and, you know, demonizing it. But at the same time, it's not sort of masochistically 
or, or sadistically wishing for the suffering to remain. And, and there, there are certain you know, personality types that form an identity around the suffering. Yeah. And there's the, the, there's a very famous uh, book by the German writer um, Thomas Mann that won a Nobel Prize in the uh, 1930s. And he, and he basically talks about the sanatorium, which was just the old word for like a, a rehab facility, where a lot of people suffering from chronic illnesses would go up into the mountains of Switzerland and sort of convalesce over there. And, and it looks into this, this, this little community of sick people and how they form these identities around their own suffering in such a way that they're sort of a superiority contest as to who has the more serious disease and who is suffering more than the other. And it sort of becomes their little badge of honor that, oh, I suffer the most because look at my illness, it's completely debilitating. At least you can walk around a few times a day. So, so absolutely. And I think we see some of that in some, some religions, especially the Abrahamic religions, where there's this kind of obsession with suffering and doing penance and suffering more the, and the guilt and the shame and kind of yeah. almost makes the, it makes the uh, uh, culture out of, you know, sort of wallowing in your own suffering. So absolutely, you know, there is the tendency to go in that direction as well, as there is to, you know, vilifying and demonizing people's experiences who are suffering. And whether that be a physically induced sort of pain or disease or whether that be psychologically created, right, through, through any number of, you know, um, complexes we might develop through life. Uh, if I look back at my own past, a lot of the suffering that I experienced was, you know, self-generated, psychologically generated. There were catalysts in my, in my environment, for sure, that triggered that suffering and trauma to come up. But beyond that, I mean, I kept it alive. I kept it thriving. It sort of reveled in that identity of the poor me who was suffering and the victim of life circumstances, who couldn't cope with life and life was unfair to her, you know, angst and this and that. But I also realized, looking back, that if somebody, if, if a wise teacher, or and I was reading spiritual books back then already, but if somebody had said to me, hey, this is a choice, you don't have to feel this way, there's a way to, there was no way for me to go from there to that without suppressing something within myself and trying to either mimic or emulate something I wasn't yet ready to be and wasn't spontaneously feeling within myself. Mm -hmm. So regardless, there was no way to shortcut that process. I just had to go through the shit to get out of the shit. It's kind of the last scene of, of Shawshank Redemption. He's got to crawl through that 10 miles of human waste in order to get out into, the, into freedom. And there's no way to bypass that. Um, and it almost seems like you know, the word bypass is great because it almost seems like a lot of teachings, whether they're promising to or not, become interpreted by the people who are suffering as a way to bypass the hard way, the hard path of going through and working their own stuff out, whether that be addiction, whether that be relationship issues, whether that be self-esteem issues, whatever it might be, that, hey, there's this other way. If I just listen to this person, or I just read this book, I just practice what they're saying, I'll get to bypass it and get to that point that they seem to be at and not have to go to the hard stuff. Um, and, and, you know, in my view, there's really no shortcutting anything. Life is life and you got to live it up. Right. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, well, I don't think anything ends until it ends, you know. Uh, so someone said... Uh, I forget whether they were talking about suffering or what, but it's like having sex with a 900 pound gorilla. You're not done until the gorilla's done. <laughs> right. um, you know, I don't think, I mean, I don't think I could have sobered up until it just happened. I mean, and the way it all happened, I met this great therapist and, you know, and, but how all that came together is, you know, it's like, how does anything come together? You know, and why did I sober up and the person next to me in the bar ended up dying of alcohol addiction? You know, I don't know. And um, so, yeah, I don't think, and there's plenty of evidence for that, that, you know, you can't, no one's going to sober up until somehow there's some internal thing where they're ready 
and, 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 and there's some combination of being ready at the exact moment that you also meet someone who can help you or you, or maybe you just suddenly have the resources for yourself or whatever it is, but until that happens somehow mysteriously through the 10 million whatevers, um, the suffering isn't going to end. But it doesn't mean we don't we don't try to offer what we can, perhaps, you know, like like um, you know, there are people out there offering recovery programs and offering therapy, psychotherapy, and ways that you can work with depression. And those things have been helpful. Some of those things have been helpful to me. Um, and um, so again, it's it's you know, it's sort of it's not that I think we're going to eliminate the dark side of life or that we're going to eliminate suffering or that we're going to, or that we should even, but that I don't think that's possible. And I don't think it would necessarily be a good thing <laughs> for all the reasons that you've gone into and that I agree with. But, um, but at the same time, you know, there's kind of a natural movement. Like, you know, if somebody keels over in front of me, I'm going to probably try to help them up or call 911 or, you know, I'm, I'm not just going to say, well, suffering is part of life. <laughs> uh, it's kind of a natural thing that we, we move to help each other somehow. But yeah, part of why I titled my book, Death, the End of Self-Improvement, was that, you know, I was really trying to point beyond that kind of, that kind of, I mean, we live in a culture that's sort of obsessed with self-improvement. And I agree that a lot of spirituality really feeds into that. And, you know, where we're, we feel, well, I think, I think we kind of naturally as feeling sep when we feel separate, we feel naturally kind of deficient and lacking and something's missing. And, you know, we live in a culture where there's a tremendous, you know, we look at the billboards and there's all these gorgeous people and they, the advertisements, they all seem so happy and the spiritual teachers look happy if they're not being honest about some parts of their lives. And, and you know, so then we get obsessed with trying to fix ourselves and be better and read one self-help book after the next and, and we're never good enough. And, and, but I think what, every time I've been in therapy, every time I've gone to a spiritual teacher or whatever, it always seems like the ultimate message is you're fine just the way you are. And at the same time, they were offering me tools for, you know, what I could do if I was feeling overwhelmed with depression or something. You know what I mean? Like, so it's not either, it's not one or the other. Does yeah, that make and, sense? And, uh, absolutely. And, and, you know, you and I agree there for sure, where I've always seen this, this dynamic of teaching and learning being a very human dynamic. It's happening in society all the time. And this is just how human beings have related to one another, right? If I've experienced something that you're experiencing right now, especially if it's a hardship and I've been through it, then there's a guidance I can provide you, whether I'm a spiritual teacher or a bartender or just someone you met at the grocery store. That's something that naturally happens, right? And it's not a one, not necessarily a one-way relationship because what I can guide you on today, you know, tomorrow you might be guiding me on something else. And so this is just a very natural human interaction, this ability and desire we possess to, like you said, you see somebody fall down on the thing, you're gonna to wanna to help them up, right? It's, it's empathy, it's compassion, it's understanding that we suffer. And so when you see somebody else suffer, to alleviate that suffering somehow, whether it's through words or actions or buying them a meal, whatever it might be, right? Um, so in that sense, you know, I think you're right. Being the right person at the right time in a person's life can be game changing. You know, but that right person could, could literally be somebody who, who stopped on the side of the road when other cars were passing you by you know, when, when, when you went into a ditch, or it could be, like you said, you know, an alcoholic having a conversation with a bartender. The bartender could be the right person, the right person, the right place, the right time in their life. Similarly, it could be a spiritual teacher or a book um, or any number of things. Yeah. You know, but, but when we create, the, when we crystallize these identities around these helping and teaching roles that we all organically provide each other, and we make people into the helpers or the teachers of human beings, then what ends up happening is we lose that organic two-way interaction. And then the pressure falls upon the person uh, in that role 
to be the person who's walking around society looking for everyone who's falling down to pick them up or, or driving around looking for cars and ditches because it's their job to help a person out of a ditch. That would be absurd. Obviously, you know, we wouldn't expect you know, people to take on those roles. But somehow when it comes to spiritual life and uh, you know, when we suffer, we seem to think that this one person can fulfill that role consistently. And I think it's an unfair expectation both for the, for the recipient to have and for it to be imposed on the person helping out. Because yeah, they might be the right person at the right time in one person's life, but absolutely the wrong person at the wrong time in another person's life. But then the expectation of that role becomes they're always the right person at the right time in everybody's life. And so my, my gripe or complaint in general with the industry is how we tend to box people into these little sort of containers of expectations that don't really serve uh, the, the, the dynamic in the long run, doesn't serve the teacher themselves, doesn't serve the, the student, and then becomes sort of congealed in this expectation of, okay, well, you're going to help me anytime I have a problem, right? What about like, you know, like, well, over the course of my 73 years, I've seen enormous changes in society. And for example, among the changes I've seen, when I was growing up, doctors were just regarded as infallible authorities on medicine. And you went to the doctor and they told you what to do and you just did it. You didn't question them. You didn't ask questions. And sometimes, you know, with women, they didn't even tell you you had cancer. They told your husband because they thought, you know, you couldn't handle it. And, you know, we have gotten to a very different place where, not to say it's perfect, but, you know, doctors are, well, there's a lot more women in the profession now, which I think has made a huge difference. And, you know, they're not necessarily wearing a white coat anymore. They're often not wearing a white coat. They're, you know, they'll explain things to you. You can ask questions. Um, they'll tell you that, you know, they, they, it's up to you what level of, of intervention you want and, and well, there's this possibility or this one, and what do you think? And, um, so it's really changed. And I've seen the same thing. I mean, if you go back in the spiritual world to the old days, maybe, um, and some of the, some teachers are still very much using this old model, but you know, where you have sort of guru devotee thing, well, the teacher is, you know, the awakened one, the enlightened one, and the flawless one, and the seeker is the poor, miserable, in need person. And, and but I, you know, many contemporary spiritual teachers are, you know, more and more are being out, out there and honest about that they've suffered from depression or that they they had a bout with drinking or whatever it is, you know, that and and more and more sort of just being one of the group at least part of the time and and not not and consciously trying not to not to come off as uh in some special category and um so i think i think that there's been a general recognition of that kind of problem and that humanity is maybe kind of um again professors teachers you know many people who are in that kind of position therapists i think if you think about the traditional old psychiatrist versus the modern therapist, the people I've worked with, um, there's a world of difference, you know, in terms of not posing as someone who has all the answers and is going to fix you and doesn't have any problems themselves. Um, so, you know, I think, again, it's just kind of like, I think in a way I've always avoided, in some way I've avoided being a teacher, partly because it just doesn't feel right to me, but to think of anyone as a student or to think of myself as a teacher, but, but in some way, maybe I've avoided it, you know, maybe like, I think there's a place for, you know, being a doctor, being a psychotherapist, being a teacher, being a, you know, I didn't have any problem being a teacher when I was an English teacher in a city college. That didn't strike me that that was problematic. <laughs> um, and I, I just think that, um, so it's, it's, again, that's that kind of paradox of like how to sort of function in one of these roles or functional capacities, a doctor, therapist, spiritual teacher, whatever, without 
making yourself into some sort of elevated, special, perfect, flawless, ideal, authoritarian figure. Yeah, I think, I think you know, when comparing, let's say, a, <clears throat> a high school teacher to a um, spiritual teacher or a doctor to a spiritual teacher, one of the, the one of the differences there is that the the profession of a high school teacher is dependent on a certain very specific subject matter to be conveyed to the student. Right? There's there's an objective body of knowledge that is you know, verified by a teaching organization or a ministry of education or whatever. And the person teaching that subject, let's say you know, it's high school math, if that individual who's the teacher of that math class, it gets sick or goes on, you know, pregnancy leave or whatever, that person's role could easily just be replaced by somebody else who will teach the exact same subject matter, maybe not as effectively, maybe some personality, but the, the student is receiving that information, not from uh, the person themselves and their own personal experience necessarily, but is more geared to a certain curriculum, a certain format, and a certain technique being conveyed. So in that sense, I would compare it more to, let's say, a yoga teacher, right, where yoga teachers is teaching you some very specific exercises and ways of manipulating your body that, you know, they say are very beneficial for he your health and so on. Uh, similarly with the doctor, there's a, there's a long path of education, you know, science-based education that is then converted into their medical practice. And they're very closely regulated by um, a governing body of, of, of uh, medical professionals. And, you know, they have to report and, the, the, and they can be sued for malpractice and all kinds of things, right? They, especially doctors in the U.S. are constantly being sued for malpractice, even some of the best of them. But spiritual teaching, on the other hand, you know, A, some of it is highly subjective. It comes down to the teacher's own subjective experience of life. So whereas a math teacher is teaching, is not teaching their opinion, they're teaching some very like objective mathematical concepts. A spiritual teacher, on the other hand, is sharing their subjective experience of life and how they have chosen to interpret what that experience is. Now, it may be very wise and, and might be very relevant and resonate with a lot of people, but at the end of the day, it is their own subjective interpretation of it. And so my issue there is that how can you teach somebody your own subjective experience? How can you teach them your own opinion? And that the moment you call it a teaching, it almost makes it seem like your own subjective experience of reality is objective reality. You know, that, that, that is the, the, the hidden assumption that is inserted into that equation. Because a doctor is not teaching you his opinion of what this disease is. He has a, a, a body of medical knowledge and, and some of his experience will inform that, right? As an experienced doctor versus an inexperienced one. Whereas a spiritual teacher, unless they're teaching Buddha's texts, in which case, yes, you're a teacher of specific Buddhist teachings. And you know, there's, that is a little bit different, I think, than what most uh, gurus and teachers are doing. But most of them are talking about, well, this is my experience of life, and this is my experience of no self, or this is my enlightened state, and, or this is quite simply how I experience ordinary life, and I drink, and I do this. Whichever flavor it is, I still don't see that as a teaching, right? I see that more as a sharing of perspectives and wisdom and all of that. Um, so, so interested to hear your point of view on that, on that label of spiritual teacher and how you understand it. Well, I mean, I think some of these terms, are, you know, they're just there because we need a word, you know, like, like spirituality, partly why I use it is just because, you know, I have to say that I'm, you know, somebody says, well, what are your books about? You know, they're not about mathematics. They're not about, um, <laughs> um, this or that. And I, you know, it's just a label, spirituality, non-duality. I pick up these different labels and and they're vague and they mean different things to different people, you know. So, I mean, I would kind of differ to some extent with what you just said, because I feel like the high school teacher is doing a lot more than just conveying information that anyone else could convey just as well. That's part of what they're doing. But 
looking back on the teachers that had a big impact on me, they're conveying something much more. And ideally, although this is becoming less and less true, in my opinion, in the educational system, perhaps, but ideally, they're teaching you how to think and how to reason and how to explore things and how to, um, they're not just teaching you, you know, how to, the, the rules of mathematics. Again, that can depend on the subject. And, but some subjects, like an English teacher, is doing something, not, not if they're teaching grammar, but well, even then to some extent, but, but certainly if they're teaching literature or something, it's very different from teaching mathematics. Um, and a doctor, well, they, it's not just a bunch of facts. I mean, you know, a robot will eventually do some of the doctor's work better than the doctor can do it. And those parts of it that depend on, you know, comparing all the things in your history and all the things in the medical knowledge world. But there's something else that a doctor's doing that is not in that realm that a robot will never replace, in my opinion. Um, and and so, so I guess I'm saying none of those things are quite as cut and dry. And I, you know, to me, a spiritual, you know, like, like what Tony Packer was offering, you know, to me was she was inviting us to really look, you know, well, look and see, can you find this me? Who is it that's feeling defensive? Can you find the one who's feeling defensive? She wasn't, she didn't come at it as like, there is no self. Uh, this is the truth. It was like, well, look for this me. See if you can find it. What is it? Where is it? You know, or, or you know, just look. Watch as choices and decisions happen. See if you can find a decider in there. How does it happen? She wasn't like, well, there's no choice. <laughs> um, and, and she was also at the same time saying, you know, you, anything I say, you can question. Maybe I'm wrong. So, so it was an invitation to explore and question combined with, you know, just sitting in silence and, you know, tuning in to what was actually happening. The, 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 the stories that were going through the mind, the sound of the caw, caw, caw of the crows, the feeling in the body, just tuning in, waking up to what was happening. That was the whole message, you could say. Um, is that a teaching? Is she a teacher? You know, it's a word. I don't know, but it's interesting because I I I I hear what you're saying, and I I, I do appreciate that there's more to being a teacher than providing instruction. There's, there's so much more, right? And that I think that's touches upon what we were saying about just earlier. But as human beings. There's a natural desire within us, not all of us, but within many of us, to guide other, others who we see struggling or still on that path to understanding something we've understood. Um, you know, I, I reflect on my, my late aunt who growing up was not just my aunt, but she was also my, my high school Shakespeare teacher. Uh -huh. right? she, was, she was one of those teachers that students remember many, many, many years later, you know, they um, when she she died, died tragically in a car accident in her late fifties, students came from all, you know overseas to attend her funeral. That's yeah. how much of an impact she had on their life. So obviously she was way more than a teacher to them. But in terms of my own life and the guiding factor that she was in my own life, she she guided me in her role as a Shakespeare teacher, but she was also guiding me in her role as an aunt, right? So, mm -hmm. so that guiding was happening regardless of whether she was playing the role of English teacher or not. Uh, and I think any good teacher or a good doctor or a good, good professional in a position of providing any form of guidance, to you, even a plumber, will, in addition to their services, at, you know, technical services will provide you some wisdom that you can use that 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 is relevant to your own life. Um, you know, I've, I've we've had some contracting work in the house where you know we've, we've had some real struggles getting some things fixed, and there have been some great um, you know, contractors come in who not just who don't just talk about what the work that needs to be done but will sort of help you understand how to take care of your house better in the long term and all of that, give you that perspective, which is fantastic. So I appreciate that that is 
a role that a lot of teachers, spiritual teachers will, will provide that guiding, that mentoring, that, that providing that wisdom that may be relevant. Um, so I think, you know, I definitely see your perspective there. I also think that when you take on the role of teacher, and again, this is just a label. So at a certain point, it may just be splitting hairs. And I don't think, you know, one, any one perspective is absolutely right on, on it. But when you talk about the role of a teacher, there must be that objective, instructive aspect to it as well, in addition to the guiding and the wisdom. And that, when it comes to spiritual teaching, that object, objective thing is missing altogether, I find. There is no body of, of um, technique or process that is A, regulated to make sure that, you know, these guys aren't just doing whatever, it's not a wild west, which is really what spiritual culture has become the wild west, where anybody can claim to be a teacher, anybody can claim to be able to guide you to anything. Um, and, and you really don't know who you're dealing with because there's no sort of standard to which um, people have to hold themselves. And so you might end, be lucky and end up with somebody like a, you know, like some of the people you've encountered, like a Tony Packer, who's very democratic in the way she approaches her students. But then you might end up with uh, absolute maniacs running cults and, you know, oppressing their students or exploiting them or sexually abusing them. And we've seen so many of those cases come up too. And I'm not saying that doesn't happen in education and that that doesn't happen in medicine, but we at least know that there are um, checks and balances in place to hold well, people responsible to their, to their, the people they're serving, right? But there are in, in, I mean, in many spiritual traditions, there is definitely a path that you go through. Um, like in the koan traditions, you pass a certain number of koans, you know, and there's a there's a long. I wasn't in that type of Zen. Well, I have sat with with John Taran, a koan teacher, but I mean, it's not really my path. But anyway, but I mean, so there. And then, but even if there's not a koan path, it's like you have to be, you know, you get you get certified by your teacher basically that you are ready to teach, and there are, you know, there are in Buddhism, there are all these organizations now, the associations and organizations and all sorts of rules in place about sexual exploitation and teacher-student relationships and all this and that. And there are people trying to bring that same thing into the non-dual satsang, you know, whatever we call this universe that you and I are aware of, you know, that shows up at sand conferences and stuff. Um, they're trying to bring that same thing into that world. I kind of personally think that's not gonna work because it's not a, it's not a homogeneous body in the same way that, that a certain Zen school is a kind of homogeneous body. Um, and you know, within that wide amorphous group, people don't even agree on what spirituality is or what non-duality is or what the point of doing all this is or anything you know so it's like how are you gonna and i'm i i'm not sure that having that kind of oversight is necessarily a good thing either i mean i it can have its negative side which is sort of um for all the reasons that you know we just went into about why suffering is an important part of life um it, not that you want teachers to be abusive or anything but i mean when you start trying to regulate those things, you can get yourself into some, there can be pitfalls of a different kind, let's put it that way. And uh, so. I, I actually agree with you there because the only reason you would have to regulate something is if it's already institutionalized, right? And, and I'm, actually, I'm actually against the institutionalization of these things, you know? So where I'm coming from is, why make spiritual teaching a thing? But if you're going to make it a thing, then you might need to regulate it because everybody's going to claim to be a spiritual teacher. It's like the new sheriff in town. It's walking into Dodge, okay, I just slap a, a star on, I'm the new sheriff, everyone's listening to me. But, but why, what qualifies you? Um, but, or, you know, we can look at this whole idea of spirituality in a totally new light, as in, there is no authority in this realm of spiritual experience because spiritual experience 
is purely subjective experience. When we think, talk about other things like you know, teaching English or you know, administering medicine, some of those things are objective, they can be taught and therefore they should be regulated because you know, we have a very objective standard against we can, which we can measure people's behaviors and say, okay, well, this doctor is obviously misprescribing or so on and so forth, right? Whereas when you get into spirituality, now we're, we're talking about the, the realm of how humans experience life and relationship and all that. In that. In that realm, if you don't have those objective markers, and I don't think we need to, right? this is really a sharing and a guiding, right? You're not gonna, you know, if a bartender gives you some advice or somebody helps you when you fall down on the road, you're not gonna have Hold them to some standard of how they helped you. Well, did, did you did you really do a great job of helping me stand up? Could you have done better? Is there a standard on how you should help people stand up in the fall in the road? Obviously not. This is just organic. Um, and I, I really think our spiritual interactions and the guidance we provide should be organic. And so I don't think we, sh we ought to regulate this industry because in my opinion, this shouldn't even be an industry at all. There shouldn't be these roles of spiritual teachers and seekers and all of that. That's what builds the industry, right? But, but I play devil's advocate here because, for example, at Springwater, um, Tony Packer's place, initially she said she was never going to name successors. Um, if, you know, the work meant something to people, they would, it would carry on in one way or another. In the end, she did name some people, you know, ask some, well, the way she put it, it was she asked people to carry on the work. And I think that was a valuable thing that she did that because um, because I think there is there may not be the same level of objective standard that you could get in terms of whether somebody understands mathematics correctly, but she certainly had a sense of who understood her work and who you know who was really. Um, Who she felt would be would be um, would be capable of carrying this on in a good way, you know, in a way that. Um, and whereas there were clearly people there who might have even wanted to teach, but who didn't really had had kind of missed the maybe some of the most important aspects or something, and and one of the things we had there. A lot was these group discussions where and, and retreats where anyone could give talks and you know group discussions and things like this and and they were valuable in their own way sort of like being in a community is valuable because you know you have to look at all your own reactions and everything else but but certainly there was a difference between what some people were offering and what other people were contributing and so, so I would ask you, you know, when when you talk about Tony Pack, Packer naming successors to carry on the work. Now, what work was that? Was that her own work? Or was that some work that was objectively, it was completely outside of her that somebody could carry on? Because well, the way I look at it is Tony, there's only one person who could be Tony Packer there, right? And and any of the work coming out of her would have been her work. And there's no way anybody could carry on her work. They could only carry on their own work, well, which they would, may or may not align with her work. Okay, right? what, what she was, what, what I think she meant by the work was um, seeing the ways that the conditioned mind, you know, seeing how the conditioned mind operates, seeing how we form identities, how we, um, how we get defensive, all the ways the conditioned mind operates, exploring all that, and also coming upon the sort of openness or stillness or presence, this possibility of being in a different kind of open, spacious, um, spaciousness. And the role of a teacher, although she didn't use the word, was somebody who would look with you who would who would you know basically be asking questions who would look with you not someone who would tell you how the universe worked 
And so in terms of looking for people she would ask to carry on, it was people that that clearly had a sense of both of those things and were clearly had clearly been engaged in that process of sort of seeing seeing the conditioned mind. Not that they'd come to an end of that process, but that they were deeply engaged in that process and and that they did have a sense of that open, spacious, unconditioned place, you might say, and that they that they that they that they weren't going to just be telling people how everything worked, that they were going to be um, looking with people and all of that sort of thing. And so it was on that basis that I think, so I think there is, again, it's not, it's not as objective as, you know, the kinds of qualifications you might have for someone who's going to teach math or basic arithmetic. But I don't think it's just completely subjective either. I think there's, I think, um, I don't think, I mean, in one sense, yes, nobody experiences the world exactly the way I do. They're, it's questionable whether there's even a world out there, you know, so in that sense, yeah. I'm, but in another sense, I just don't feel like we're all completely walled off and alone in that way. I feel like it's a very intersubjective, there's something much more relational going on. And so I don't think that Yes, no one was exactly Tony Packer, but I do think that what she was talking about and pointing to is something that other people also got and, and embodied and including myself. And, and while that might not be as objective as, do you know that two plus two equals four, I don't think it's just completely amorphous either. So, so one of the, so one of the, there, there are two aspects I would say to, you know, let's say running a, a Zen Academy or center like the spring water is one is the practical aspect of keeping the Academy going, which is whoever is the, you know, managing as the, the head teacher somebody will have to take over for, for the practical management of that aspect. So, so in that sense, picking a successor makes absolute sense. Somebody has to keep the center going. But in terms of continuing the, the, the theme of the teaching or the, the particular perspective of the teaching, um, what I've seen is that teachers will generally name students as successors whose views and perspectives align closely with their own. You know, they're not going to, if there's a certain teacher, with, if there's a teach, teacher with a certain personality um, and a certain perspective of how students should be engaging in their practice and all of that, they're not going to pick someone who's radically opposite, you know, right. instead of sitting in meditation, say, okay, let's all go drink here at the bar. And so there is that preference and that bias, which informs how they name their successors. And then the successor will carry on that strain of teaching that same perspective with a little bit of flair of their own perhaps, and then name another successor. And that's how a lineage is formed. Well, what happens is over time, because everybody's saying the same thing in the same way, and you have that, the weight and the gravity of history and ancestry and succession, all communicating the same thing to the seeker. The seeker begins inadvertently over time to believe that is the only perspective on reality. So it may not happen with the first iteration, you know, with, with the Tony Packer, she's new, she's fresh, she's the first one in her lineage and there's, it's spontaneous. With the second one, they're saying, you know, something slightly different, but more kind of along the lines of what Tony Packer say. But with each iteration that goes down after a certain point, and we've seen this with a lot of teachers, whether that be Buddha or Ramana or whoever, who has come down that lineage, is that they're saying the exact same thing this, the, the first person started the lineage set. And they're saying it in such a way that now it just, it's stated as fact. It's no longer perspective. And that is one of, you know, I think the pitfalls of the whole spiritual teacher identity and maybe successors. And this happened in Zen, you know, the whole robe and bowl handover and all of that. Um, and I think that's where even Zen has lost its way over time, that spontaneity 
that it began with has become sort of very dogmatic and indoctrinated. Um, but again, you know, like you yourself said in the beginning when we started chatting about this is, yes, those pitfalls and those dogmas and all of that do exist, but that doesn't necessarily completely negate or, or uh, you know, re remove the legit legitimacy of the value that these people can provide the guidance and all that. So I think, you know, I think you and I are closely aligned in a lot of ways when we, when we look at this general interaction and relationships of human beings guiding other human beings and the value there is in that. I'm a little bit more, I'd say maybe <clears throat> critical of these identities that people form, right? Well, yeah, I'm critical of it being an identity. <laughs> and, um, and I think it's true that um, what you said about, you know, the original person um, has a kind of freshness. And then, you know, like if you take spring water, I, I pick spring water as an example out of all the places I've been just because it's a place that sort of started with the idea of not carrying on a tradition and not being a tradition, not having a teacher. Um, you know, and yeah. How, how is it doing today out of curiosity? Now that, I mean, you have that point of reference to how it first started. Um, and, and not to you know single out spring water, just only because you've had experience with it. How would you compare the way the teachings are conducted today as opposed to how they were when they first started? Um, well, it seems to be alive and well. There's you know a group of maybe eight people or something like that who are you know holding retreats and stuff. And um, and Um, you know, I don't think, yeah, I think it's doing well. I mean, I'm not really sure exactly, but, but, uh, and I don't really want to comment on spring water in particular in, you know, in two specific ways. But what I will say is that I agree that there is a tendency once we have a lineage or even a lineage that isn't supposed, supposedly isn't a lineage, like for example, Tony Parsons and all the people that sort of have followed him, like Jim Newman and, and, Kenneth Madden and all those people, they all sound exactly alike, you know, they're all sort of, but it's, there's no official lineage, you know, um, and, and then when there is a, you know, like with spring water, okay, we'll talk about, you know, there was, there was some, once you, you purchased a building and you purchased some land and you, you, well, they, they didn't purchase the building, they built the building, they purchased the land, built the building, you've done all that, you've created this place, it's a beautiful place in nature, um, you've put all this work into it. You, there's a natural, want, you know, wanting to sort of keep it going, and you want to keep the work going because you, you, you know, you find it really genuinely meaningful. And but it does develop its own personality over time, you know. And the same thing, I've seen that in John Terrence, Pacific Zen. You know, they're they're very out of the box, but in a way, they're kind of out of the box in a similar way. You know, all the different teachers. You know, it, it's like. I think that's just sort of an inevitable thing that any time you have a human organization, like a human being, it develops a kind of personality. Um, and that personality often has a lot to do with the personality of the founder. And, um, and as it passes down through the generations, there's definitely a tendency for it to get very stale and sort of dead. And Tony actually, you know, spoke to me about that, that, the, the, that you know, it's good to be on your own because you're not referring back to her. Um, and, um, so that's a danger. And then maybe, you know, along the way, someone new comes along within that quote tradition or lineage or whatever, non-lineage or whatever you want to call it. Someone new comes along that suddenly sort of breaks it open again, some new way. And maybe that person breaks it open in such a way that they have to leave because they don't fit in, or maybe they break it open and, you know, everybody kind of you know, things kind of shift. I don't know, but, but it seems like, and there definitely have been many teachers, like Nisargadatta was, you know, adamant about not creating any kind of institution or place or ashram or anything. Joko Beck was adamant about not creating any kind of residential center 
um, Krishnamurti didn't create any kind of, and yet the Krishnamurti Foundation sprung up, you know, to preserve him. And, and uh, so it's like, it seems to be a human tendency that when we find something really meaningful to us, we want to keep it going. We want to keep it alive. And then maybe in the process of doing that, we kill it. Yeah, and, that, and that's, uh, that's a great observation because yes, we, we, we do want to find meaning in things, right? And that, that can be a, a group, an institution, a teaching, it can be our own family members. I mean, who wants to let, you know, your loved ones go, right? And uh, it's a very interesting quote I read recently. I can't remember who it was by, but the, it was an excerpt from a poem. Um, could have been Mary Angelou, but I'm not... Don't quote me on that one. I'll try and find the, the actual quote. But it's it said something like, while the people we love are still here, hold on to them as absolutely tightly as you can. I'm paraphrasing it. But the moment it's time for them to go, let them go. And I think it's that shift of recognition that the time has come to let it go where we really struggle. Yeah. Right? And, and so people want to do one of two things. They either want to never form that attachment in the first place so that when it's time to let it go, it'll be easy, or they can't let go and they just want to hold on forever. And it's really that willingness to be attached as long as the attachment exists and then the willingness to allow it to go when it's very clear it's leaving anyways, right? And I think that's that, you know, nuanced perspective on life that I think we're all slowly attempting to develop. And so um, I want to thank you, Joan Tollefson, for joining me on this call. This has been a great conversation, as always, a first time actually publicizing it. But I know you and I have had some great chats together. And, and somehow, even though we might come at things from different perspectives, we're, we're able to appreciate each other's view. And I can definitely say I've my whole perspective on things has has definitely become richer for having talked to you. So well, thank um, you. Yeah, I feel the same way. Um, you definitely, I, I always appreciate our conversations and, and uh, definitely makes me see things in fresh ways, and think about things in new ways. Thanks a lot, Joan. And, and hopefully we'll get to do this again sometime soon. I look forward to it. Okay, have a wonderful day. You too. Bye.